thank you all for <laughs> spending your lunch hour with us today. Thank you. Um, so I would like to take a moment uh, just to recognize that California is home to Native nations whose land we are living on and acknowledge that USC in particular is located on Tongva land. We, honor the, we also honor the legacy of the African diaspora and recognize that this country would not exist without the free and slave labor of black people. We share these acknowledgments for three reasons. One, to pay respect to the original caretakers of the land. Two, to raise awareness about histories that are too often erased or forgotten. And three, to recognize our place in history and affirm our own commitment to social change. So please, if we can just take a moment, feel the ground under your feet and honor the land. While we recognize that the theft of land and labor must not be performative, we must move to racial care. What does it look like for you as an individual, and how does that extend to the institutions you serve? So just hold the hold the spots close to your eyes. And so we are here. We are indeed going to have a treat today. This is a series of lunch and learns that we do in the spring and in the fall semester. So you're welcome to come back every every semester and engage with us, different topics. Um, we often start with some form of art. So today we will have a poet, but, um, some poetry by our wonderful poet organizer, her name is Violet Rose. Her body of work weaves art and activism exploring the intersection of race, gender, sexuality, and self-love. So without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Violet Rose. Thank you. I'm so honored to be here and to share space with all of you. Um, I think a few talks I'm going to read in their entitled episode, Give the Computer of In the heart of every community, a radiant flame burned bright, ignited by the unyielding spirit of communal cares and wavering light. It's in the secret act of lifting each other up, like soaring kites where justice rides and inequalities disrupt your path, face flight. Guiding us through the labyrinth of darkness, shedding truth's incandescent light. In the tireless quest for equity, they paved the way, creating boundless reservoirs of knowledge and resources every single day. But equity's grand tapestry begins with the tender embrace of inclusion's grace, building expansive spaces where we voice find, where our voice, where every voice finds the sacred place. Diversity blossoms and blooms when inclusion takes the lead, fostering growth and innovation in a kaleidoscope of colors, a vibrant scene. Ensuring our precious resources remain within our community's warm embrace, for it's the ethos of community over competition, find the golden key, unlocking the boundless potential of collaborations, setting each other gloriously free. In the face of a question's relentless storm, we stand tall and resolute. Shoulder to shoulder, hand to hand, where our courage takes root. United in our unwavering mission, we rise like majestic phoenixes in the sky, building a future where justice reigns supreme, where our hope shall never die. In the dance of life, a sacred pact we weave to nurture ourselves, our spirits to retreat. From the temple of our being, we find strength to embrace and hearts to bind, self care to compass the guiding light, fueling the soul, igniting all of our might. And tending to ourselves, we grow, we learn to give a gift to the world and how we live. With justice as a cornerstone, we stand, embracing diversity hand in hand. Each voice, a melody, and the grand choir, harmony found in every desire. Inclusion, our beacon, our shining bright. Welcome all in the gentle light. For in unity, we find our strength, a tapestry woven of equal light. Research institutes, guardians of truth, 
illuminate our paths for both age and both youth. In quest for justice, they lead the way, empowering our voices. All that come and all that may. Together in a circle, we thrive as community care helps us revive. For the interplay of self and society, we find the essence of our true harmony. And then continuing our honor of self care and self love and community, I believe that communal care is the only true way that we can really practice self care. Um, so I'm leaving you with as in the heart of every struggle, in the depths of every pain, lies a power of community where healing begins to reign. In the shared embrace, in the warmth of caring hands, that we find solace and strength where together we stand. For in the beauty of community, we discover our true selves, in the arms of solidarity where nobody dwells. Through the trials and tribulations, through the darkest of nights, we find the comfort in each other as we fight for what's right. In our quest for social justice, in our fight to unite, it's the power of community that ignites the light. We gather our voices, we amplify our cries, <clears throat> knowing that together we can reach the skies. But it's not just a protest, not just in the streets, that community shines brightest where love and care meet. <coughs> It's in the everyday moments in the bonds that we create that we find healing and hope before it's too late. Communal care is the balm for our weary souls. It's the antidote to loneliness, the key to making us whole. When our bodies ache with pain, when exhaustion takes its toll, it's the community around us that helps us to console. So let's look at our communities with our eyes wide open and see the beauty within them with love as our guide. Let's care for one another in the ways that truly matter, and together we'll find healing in the midst of all the chatter. For communal care is self-care, it's the fuel for our souls, it's the foundation for our strength as we reach for our goals. So come together, hand in hand, heart to heart, build a world of equity where healing is our heart. Stay with a more open heart. So it is my pleasure to introduce uh, our current Trapanjian Chair in Civic Society and Social Change postdoctoral scholar, Dr. Leah Bruce. Leah completed her doctorate in sociology at Harvard last year. Her primary research interests center on the role of community organizations as vital aspects of the social safety net in how they shape access to the resources for individuals, opportunities to build networks, and promote civic engagement, and respond to governmental policies and funding influence. That's a mouthful, Leah. Yeah. <laughs> Leah's scholarship contributes primarily to the study of organization and inequality, poverty, but also engages with urban sociology, political sociology, social policy, and social networks. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Leah Goose, who will introduce our panel for today. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm so excited to see all these wonderful faces out in the crowd. Um, our panel today um, was expertly selected by uh, wonderful people at ERI, and I'm really excited, so please just Except my enthusiasm. Um, first up on our panel today is Joseph Tomas McKellar, and he's the executive director of PICO California, a faith-based community organizing network in California, the largest, in fact, in the state. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Second up is Jennifer Ito. She's with our um, ERI staff, and she's the research director there, and she has been for the past 11 years. Yeah. 
Mark Philpart is a community organizer and the executive director of the California Black Freedom Fund. And Sulma Arias is a community organizer and the executive director of People's Action Institute, an organization with which she has been for over two decades. called Making Movements, Aligning Organizing, Philanthropy, and Research for Social Change. So kind of framing where we are in this moment, my hope is by the end of this that we've got an understanding a little bit more about what all of these things mean for everyone on this panel and what that means for you all, what you can take out of these doors with you. And the focus of this panel is building lasting movement structure, which generally we can think of includes tangible resources, morally um, bound and ethically oriented ideas, people, communities, history, and then everything that's needed to sustain that infrastructure in the face of change, challenge, and time. It's a long-term, beyond the horizon kind of end goal. That's lasting infrastructure. And to be oriented to such time-intensive work requires a continuously burning fire. And I'm curious if each of you could share what the Kindle was for you in the still burning fire. What was that instigating moment that continues to animate your engagement in this long-term work of building lasting infrastructure? What was that thing that started you off that's gonna keep you going? So I'm gonna start, we'll start farthest and come this way. <laughs> well, thank, thank you, can you all hear me okay? All right, great. Leah, thank you so much. Thank you for opening us up and for welcoming us with such a generous spirit. I'm so honored to be with all of you and most of all with these distinguished panelists, with Sulma and Mark and Jennifer, people who I just have such an immense amount of respect for. Um, I love the question. I actually picked up on the poet's reference to starting fires. How many of you know how to start a campfire? How do you start a campfire? Dry. Matches. The determination. The determination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe kindling, right? You need kindling. What happens if you try to light the log directly on fire? Doesn't work, right? So we sometimes use this analogy to describe organizing because I think in the world of kind of um, sometimes in philanthropy, sometimes in academia, we want to figure out how do you get the flame on fire? I'm sorry, how do you get the log on fire? But we know organizing and social movements require the kindling that is made up of relationships of slow, steady, patient, disciplined, strategy development, infrastructure creation, narrative change, and over time you get the log on fire. Um, and I think of that in regards to the own, my own fire, my own flame, if you will, that was lit when I started organizing back in 2005. I can't believe it's already gonna be almost 20 years that I've been organizing. Um, I organized in uh, North Orange and Central Orange County um, back in 2005. I was organizing in Fullerton, Santana, and Anaheim. And I'll never forget the moment I fell in love with organizing I was organizing in a low-income part of Southwest Fullerton, predominantly immigrant part of that city, in a city that is kind of more middle class and a, and a more conservative region of our state. And I was organizing with a group of parents um, who were concerned about safety in the neighborhood. Um, and I worked in particular with a father of three named Mario. And Mario loved soccer. He played soccer with his children, he coached soccer in a park called Richmond Park in the middle of the Valencia neighborhood of <coughs> Southwest Fullerton. And, um, and it was this park that was full of kids and full of families up until the sunset. 
And when the sun set, it got dark, and there was drug dealing and kind of gang activity in that park. And he and other parents wanted to do something about it. And we sat down and we talked about potential solutions, and the solution was not more police. It wasn't let's get more police to do something about the illicit activity in the neighborhood. The solution that they came up with was lights. They said, let's put lights in that park. And we created a group we called the Valencia Task Force. It was made up of parents who coached soccer and parents who lived in the neighborhood. And we learned through meetings with the city that the city maintained the property of the park, um, but that the school district actually owned the property. So we had to get not just the city council, but also the school board to agree to put lights in the park. And spirituality played a big role in, I think, helping people understand the deeper act of creation that they were a part of. There are kind of deep philosophical and spiritual roots to the notion of light versus darkness. In fact, there's scripture in the Christian tradition that says, you don't, if you have light, you don't put it under a bushel basket. You put your light on top of a lampstand so it can give light to the world. And King said, you, darkness doesn't drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate does not drive out hate, only love can do that. And so where there, there was these kind of moments, these rituals that we created to help us tap into a deeper, more transcendental kind of dimension of our work. Back. And long story short, um, we got the city council and the school board to commit $650,000, which is not a small amount of money to put in athletic lighting in this low-income park in Southwest Fullerton. And we did it by having a mobilization. We got 300 people, youth, and parents to fill up this park. And we invited the mayor and the school board president to come and make this commitment and hear stories. The thing I love about that story, the thing that caused me to fall in love with organizing and social change is what Mario did later on. After having won this victory, after having stepped into public life, a few months later in 2006, he was a big part of mobilizing the immigrant community in Orange County to fight for comprehensive immigration reform. And sometimes big change starts with very practical demands, very lived experience demands. And after having that experience, here I am almost 20 years later, still trying to light the kindling that can ultimately give rise to the, the fire that we all need um, to maintain in our society today. The kindling? Yeah. <laughs> you know, for me, I'm not an organizer, but I am firmly, I'm a firm believer in organizing. I actually cut my teeth in in, in doing research as an organizer with an organizing group in South LA, Scope, by, by, founded by Anthony Thigpen. And what brought me there was growing up as a kid in Sacramento, my grandmother, we always had dinner with my grandmother. She was born in 1915 in a small town outside Sacramento. And the first time she was able to vote was for President Roosevelt who was running on a platform of a new deal for all Americans and you know, to address kind of the issues coming out of the Great Depression. Fast forward to 1942, and he was the one who signed the executive order that sent her and all of our family members to the internment camp. So my grandmother's side went to Thule Lake, my father's side over to Jerome, Arkansas. And the one thing that they always, that they taught my parents, the lesson that my parents took from that was education and knowledge is the one thing that no one can ever take away from you. And so they, that for that, for them, kind of that turned into putting me through school, the best schools um, that they could afford. And they asked for nothing in return. They just asked that I pay it forward. And so I've actually taken that and I've been able to dedicate my life to what is now our tagline for ERI, which is data and analysis to power social change. 
And so I've taken that to build knowledge in communities that don't have access, that don't have the resources, that may not be able to make it to these fine institutions like the one that we're sitting in here today. And so to me, that has been kind of what has fueled me, what continues, um, and why I love being a nerd for social change. <laughs> in the most positive sense. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, this is really a full circle moment for me. Um, I grew up down the street uh, by Crenshaw and Jefferson. And uh, the, the kindling for me was uh, in 1992. Um, you know, the, the, the LA uprising and the racial strife and uh, to see my neighborhood on fire, literally, um, really birthed in me a set of questions that I've been trying to resolve for a lifetime. Uh, questions about inequity, questions about injustice. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with Los Angeles and this particular neighborhood, you know that it's undergone some tremendous changes. Um, you know, when I was young, there was a warehouse music across the street. You probably have to look that up if you're, <laughs> if, you're if, if you don't know what that is, you could look it up. But uh, there was a Newberry's, uh, you know, it was a very uh, different uh, economic kind of corridor. Um, and, uh, you know, I grew up at a time where there was like, I, I had a profound level of insecurity. Um, I wasn't involved in any, you know, gang activity or any street life or anything of that nature, but um, what L.A. was then um, was very different from what it is now. Um, and as a young person, um, the level of insecurity had me fearful for what I could become and what I could do and just uncertain, you know, I didn't have high aspirations. Uh, for what I would do in my life. I didn't, you know, dreaming was, was not an option. It was more about a day-to-day -day kind of survival. Um, and, you know, my mom did everything she could to kind of get me into schools that would put me on a path uh, for success, uh, despite everything happening around us. Um, I had an uncle who worked at E-Television, and um, you know, that at the time was on Wilshire near Miracle Mile. And uh, you know, my mom and my uncle went into the middle school near there and they said, hey, we're married, can our, can our son go here? Um, and for those of you who know LA at the time, I mean, that's illegal. Uh, so, so essentially, you know, they were engaging in some civil disobedience uh, to try and put me on a path to where I could make it to be in front of you today. And um, it was through John Burroughs that I got introduced to this little program called USC MedCorps. Um, and from my last year at John Burroughs to when I graduated from high school, I spent every Saturday at USC um, as part of this program. Uh, that was really meant to help young people from the inner city with math, science, enrichment. Now, I didn't know what I would do with that enrichment. Uh, it was just something to do at the time. Uh, you know, keep me busy, keep me uh, engaged in, in my studies. Uh, but my mom had a, had a vision for me. And, uh, you know, I, I used that to go to Bravo Medical Magnet in East LA. Uh, and then from there went to Xavier University in Louisiana, which is kind of like the number one school for putting black people in the medical school. And as soon as I got there, I fell in love with social justice. <laughs> uh, decided to hell with medicine. Uh, I wanted to really figure out a way to, to change my community and to really uh, give back in a way that was uh, much more uh, expansive than individual care to a particular person and more about social change more broadly. And so I, I got a chance to uh, further my studies in public health and public policy um, and 
then started working at Policy Link, um, where I got the chance to meet Manuel and uh, was really mentored by Angela Glover Blackwell and uh, our late great colleague Joe Brooks. Um, and it was through that experience where I really kind of cut my teeth in uh, this movement work and got the chance to uh, really think about the actual social systems and structures um, that our communities need to be uh, uh, changed in order for there to be real transformation. And the, the one thing that was a constant throughout my experience was um, these tragedies. You know, I mentioned the LA uprising and that was in 92. And for those of you who, who know, you know, that was preceded by the murder of Latasha Harlins and, you know, so many other flashpoints. But, you know, that wasn't the only uh, period where that kindling uh, occurred, where that fire was uh, established. And, you know, there were many other instances when I first worked at Policy Link, when I first moved to Oakland. Um, in 2009, Oscar Grant was just killed. Um, just a few years later, Eric Garner was killed. Um, then Trayvon Martin, then Michael Brown, and so on and so forth. And so, um, you know, the, the fire continues to burn for me out of a deep sense of commitment to my community and the realization that change uh, is, is still needed. Well, oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. I um, I just realized as I was sitting here, we just met, we thought we just met, and when I heard your story, it was like, oh, that's what we met. I've heard this story before. <laughs> so that reminds me that it's the, the stories that continue to rekindle for me. Um, just this, you know, fire that for me started in, um, in 1999, after having lived in Kansas for um, a number of years. I migrated from El Salvador uh, by no choice of my own. Back when I was 12, 13, I uh, migrated from El Salvador into, into Kansas. But in 1999, I was stay-at-home mom, uh, homeschooling my three daughters. I was involved in church building through Assemblies of God uh, Church. And a woman by the name of Dor Laura Dungan knocked on my door. She wanted me to go door knocking with her um, and she needed an interpreter, not an organizer. She needed somebody to translate for her at the doors. Um, so I went door knocking with her, and I, you know, some of the beginning of like I, this was natural to me because I had been door knocking, doing church building work for many years. By the time I was I was 29 when she when she knocked on my door, I went door knocking with her, and I realized, um, you know, by the third or, or fourth door that I had that there was a lot of work that I was doing and connecting to people, but there were deeper underlying suffering that, that was happening uh, with the people that I had been in community with, but that I was not asking. So the fire that, that got started for me at that moment as I, as I heard the story was an anger. I was angry and I immediately connected to my, the own, my own anger um, that I think had been, um, you know, I, I grew, grew up in a church and I had to believe that everything that had happened to me up until then was meant by God or ordained by God. And the, and the moment I started hearing the stories, I think it sparked that anger in me that I had been, um, you know, just kind of hiding for a long time. Three months after I met this woman, um, a, a, a person, a man by the, the name of Shell Trapp, who is the co-founder of People's Action, the organization that I now lead, um, knocked on my door, and he asked me that question that I, that I still think about every day. That was the second time that fire um, got kindled or rekindled in me. And he asked me, why do you want to be an organizer? I didn't even know I wanted to be an organizer. I wasn't asking to be an organizer. I just, I was just, I just wanted to do more than what we were doing with church building. And so he came to my house, uh, the house that I still live in. He came to my house in March of 2000 and asked me, I want you to write, you know, as part of like, I guess, recruiting me into organizing, he said, I want you to write uh, two, two pages on why you want to be an organizer. Just tell me, tell, tell us why you want to be an organizer. He and the woman who recruited me, who was his mentee, and so I wrote this and I, 
he took me back to why I left El Salvador and, and things that I had tapped into in my own life. And the one thing I remember, I remember writing was, I never want to be in the sidelines again when there's pain. I couldn't do anything about it when I was a child in El Salvador, and I could see as I saw my friends disappearing from my classroom, and I didn't know what was going on. I couldn't do anything about it. I couldn't do anything about the injustices I was seeing. But I was 29, or 30 by then, and he was asking me again, and I had a chance to say, I never want to be on the sidelines again. And so, you know, a few months later, three months later, I was in the basement of a of an organization in Chicago doing week-long organizers training and 24 years later I'm here leading the organization that this uh, Gail Sincara and Shell Drop started 50, 50 some years ago and I think what continues to keep that fire burning for me is is the is I, I guess you become addicted to actually hearing the, and seeing the transformation in people and I am, I'm just addicted to that. I'm addicted to like getting to know people. I'm still curious about people, about hearing your story, and about seeing, and about seeing people being transformed. Mm -hmm. oh, there it yeah. is. Yeah. And about seeing that transformation in people, about hearing yeah. the story, meeting people where they're at, and then seeing them 10 years later in a different place. And I, that is just fascinating to me, and is the thing that just, keeps me going and I want to find the next person who has something, who has a story to tell, who has, who's here but needs to get here, and actually agitating that person sometimes the way that I was asking the right question. What question do I, I look at that person in the eyes and, and see what they're, what they're saying and what they're not saying and tapping into their potential. To me that's fascinating and it keeps me going. Wow. Thank you so much, each of you, for that. Um, I wanted to start with that because I think often, particularly in academia and research, we think about ideas of infrastructure and change as embedded in you know, structure and things that we know are real and exist and are very tangible. But you can't understand what's happening in your world without understanding who's a part of it and what they think and their stories. And keeping that in mind, and hearing what depth each of you are able to share about what drives you and hopefully what you can share about how that drive is embedded in things you've built and things you've grown with other people helps us keep this humanity in mind and the fact that this infrastructure is very much a shared effort um, and a story of people not just of things we know are real we, we make them and with that in mind I really want to lean into now thinking about okay we know what's driving us but what is really when we talk about this movement infrastructure, when we talk about making movements that are lasting, what does that really, really actually mean? Um, and so I want to get into the nitty gritty, as I often do, about like defining movement infrastructure. So I want to start here with Mark. There's a perspective that a need for building lasting infrastructure now is based on the fact that the movement infrastructure of the past, of the civil rights movement, has weakened. And thinking about how you outlined um, like first I'd like you to kind of explain what you think of movement infrastructure. Do you think what needs to happen is a re-strengthening of the classic ideas of the civil rights movement or is there something new that we need to be building in our movement infrastructure? I uh, appreciate this question and I, I think I probably need to first begin with describing a little bit of what I do now. Yeah. Um, in part because um, it's so relevant to the, to the question. Uh, I lead the Black Freedom Fund, which is a fund that's currently housed at Silicon Valley Community Foundation. Um, the fund was established in 2020 um, during the uprisings when, um, you know, community leaders and philanthropic leaders came to the table to kind of co-create it. Uh, and it was born from the idea that traditional <laughs> philanthropy uh, was insufficient and that we needed to transform the relationship that philanthropy had with the black community. So often in times of crisis, um, philanthropy rushes in with support, uh, but as soon as the news cycles fade, uh, so does the funding. And that kind of episodic and flash funding uh, is impossible to build really uh, powerful movement organizations uh, with. And so we needed sustained investment, we needed 
uh, commitment from the sector that would allow for movement-based organizations to really garner the resources they need to, 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 to be powerful and to advance uh, the people's agenda in a way that you know eradicates <laughs> systemic racism. Um, the notion being that by virtue of more black people being involved in policy processes, uh, spaces where they've traditionally been excluded, uh, the more uh, equity and justice you'll have. And so um, that was the founding kind of premise for us. And I'd say that our uh, civil rights legacy is incredible in this country, right? What, what has taken shape, um, I think, has inspired the, the world in many ways. Um, I think where we get ourselves into trouble is when, when we lionize that and we don't think about how to adapt to the current moment. And unfortunately, some of our legacy institutions have really struggled mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. um, there is, uh, I think, a new crop of leaders that are surfacing in many of these organizations that are trying to change how um, those institutions adapt to, them, to meet the moment. Um, but there are some really, fundamental challenges that exist. Um, and when we think about power and when we think about engaging people on the ground, um, you know, many of them don't do that as well as they need to. Um, and in part, you know, there are class issues associated with that. Um, there are technological and infrastructure issues and data issues associated with with why they don't. Um, but at the end of the day, I think, you know, newer organizations that are coming up in this moment where, uh, you know, the work is more professionalized than it's ever been, mm -hmm. very similar to labor, um, you know, where people are organizing 24 7, or not 24 7, well, <laughs> they, they, <laughs> I'm going to get myself in trouble. Josh here, I got I to gotta watch my words. But they're, but they're, you know, it's part of their work day, you know. They, 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 it's built in in a way that allows for organizing to take shape. Um, you know, many of the organizations don't have that kind of flexibility, at least in the black community. When I think about legacy civil rights organizations, it's still very volunteer-based and managing volunteer infrastructure with outdated tools is really challenging during campaigns where there's just ungodly amounts of money that are being poured in from opponents and people who are, are holding very different interests. Um, and so I think, you know, as we are considering what is next and what's needed, um, we have to take those things into account as we are building uh, new infrastructure uh, and, and, I, and I think that we've been a little slow to adapt the legacy organizations to meet that current reality. That was a really good answer. Like it answered the question. I'm just, uh, love it. Um, okay, so I'm actually gonna skip, I'm gonna switch around the order um, and ask Joseph this because you work with congregations versus directly with in communities. Um, and you have a different relationship to organizations within their own communities. Um, and in fact, you have, Pico, California has direct involvement with 500 congregations. And I'm guessing these congregations um, are across a variety of spectrums, are very different in size, how they engage in their faith, their beliefs. How do you create and employ a movement infrastructure, um, you know, idea and development strategy, strategy that can reach all of them? So a few months ago, I got to go to Montgomery and Selma, Alabama. It's my first time in the Deep South. And I met somebody there who I'll never forget. Her name was Joanne Bland. And she was one of the foot soldiers who was a part of the three marches in Selma, Alabama, um, as part of the civil rights movement's effort to expand voting rights. And she was there on Bloody Sunday in 1965 when 600 people like her marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And 
There's actually, if you've ever been there, there's a museum right there at the foot of the bridge dedicated to the foot soldiers. And they have all these pictures, not of the people in the front of the march, the people we lionize to be the leaders of our movements, but the other 590 who are in the back just marching with their families and holding pictures of Our Lady of Guadalupe and pushing strollers and holding signs and praying and, and singing. And Joanne Bland said to me, she said, the movement is always about one thing. She says the movement was never about lunch counters or being able to change clothes in the same changing room or being able to drink out of the same drinking fountain. She said the movement was and is about the redistribution of power. The other thing she said that I'll never forget is she said organizing is about three words. Steady, loving confrontation. Steady, loving confrontation. And to your question, Leah, I think all the time about our role as a state network to catalyze more steady, loving confrontation across our state, but to do it in a way that it is aligned and buttressed by the infrastructure that we provide such that it can have a maximal impact on the material conditions in which poor and marginalized people are living. And I think there's two primary strategies that we are trying to do that through right now. One is we recognize the 500 congregations and community organizations that they're a part of, these nine community organizations in our network, are operating in vastly different regions of the state, from the border with Oregon and Del Norte and Humboldt counties, all the way to the border in San Diego, and many places in between. The two things we think are gonna help us really get there, one is if we develop our organization's strategic capacity. And the second is if we improve the degree to which we are making decisions together and governing ourselves in ways that make us structurally accountable to grassroots leaders on the ground, to the foot soldiers like Joanne Bland on the ground. We are of the belief that one of the things that is limiting our ability to do better, steady, loving confrontation at scale is the fact that we have gotten into some practices where paid, mostly college-educated staff are making the strategic decisions for others versus creating the conditions for directly impacted people who may not have a college degree, who may not even speak English, to be a part of the act of creating strategy as well. We know that when people have their fingerprints all over the thing we're creating, it in turn deepens their investment and ownership of it. We are trying to teach people to become authors of their own future, not just consumers of a future that's been given to them. Yeah. And so that's one thing we're doing. The other thing is we're trying to shift how we are governed. We recently created a new leadership council, a larger strategic body made up of predominantly directly impacted people that sits alongside our paid staff in setting the direction of the network. And we experimented with ways in the past year of helping our organizations develop new ways of involving people and teaching them how to do strategy, how to make choices in an environment that is always changing, in an environment where we always have 10 options for where we go. And to be able to discern together the better of all the options that we have is a part of that muscle that we are investing a lot in, in creating. Thank you so much for that. Um, I wanted to move to our, our third uh, uh, community leader on the panel. Sulma, you have experience working in Kansas and Wichita and in California, which has me very interested in asking about, is there something special and important about place and the cities and communities in a specific state that require a shift in how you might employ your tools of movement infrastructure building in, say, California versus Kansas? Yeah, in the People's Action, the network that I am now leading for the last two years, um, has affiliate member organizations to which we are accountable in 30 states, 42 affiliates. One of them is in California. 
But I am here because someone decided that Kansas was important. Um, when it wasn't, you know, it wasn't electorally important, it wasn't a place that, you know, it, what did they call it, flyover state mm -hmm. or whatever, nobody, like, <laughs> nothing happened in Kansas, right? But 22 <laughs> years ago, somebody thought that there was the opportunity, especially back when people were, you know, leaving places like Los Angeles to move <coughs> and, and we were seeing a growing population. It was actually in, in, in uh, the director of a board, a black man, Dr. McCraw, who said, hey, we have all this uh, Hispanics moving into Kansas, maybe we should organize them. Organize them. And that's how I ended up um, being in that space. So I think for us, people at People's Action, um, you know, we organize at the intersection of race, place, and our organizing looks very different across the, the 42 affiliates. Um, in urban and rural areas. And I would say there is definitely the, the key ingredient about how you organize in different communities is the, is, is the same, I would say, that good organizer, good, good organizing, good techniques and the methodology that, you know, that we implement in our network. Um, I think it's, it's key and works in whichever place you are because it's about meeting people where they're at. Um, and one thing that to me was just incredible about how I, I came in, into this work is that the men from Chicago who went to Kansas, to Wichita, Kansas, to like, you know, have a one-to-one -one with this woman that was coming from a very conservative background, was asking me the right questions that any human being, like it was about meeting people where they're at it, it was about, you know, connecting to, um, to, to my humanity and to that sense of, self-interest that he and I could have, and, and that is the reason why I'm here. But I would say that my experience now with rural work in particular is that, in, and I've organized in places like Western Kansas, where there's like the population of 15,000 mm. 15, people in places like Art City, Dark City, and, and Liberal, where the particular, and, and we still do a lot of rural work across the network, but the particularity about smaller communities um, compared to urban cities, is that in in I I and I mean and I live in a small town. It's not rural, although a lot of you and a lot of people may think it is. It's still not rural. It's a city, um, a, a city, a small city of about three hundred and fifty thousand people. These are we go to a place, a bar like it's called Mort's. These people, these are people that you could go to their house to do a, a protest, but you will see them at the bar over the weekend. So. <laughs> So it's not like in you know in rural cities where you can do an action and you probably will never get to see those people. So so the, the the beauty and what I love and what I see about the opportunity in places like Kansas, it's about it's about power. Places like Kansas and, and other places in rural communities forces you to talk to the people that you may disagree with. Yeah. And so I think that in, in, in 2016, right after Trump won, I called some directors, I was with the firm immigrant rights movement um, back then, and, and I called two directors that I knew, and we had talked about this in Nebraska and Arkansas, because I had been saying this since tw 2000, um, 2010, when we were fighting Chris Kobach, the, you know, some of you, he was a Secretary of State, he was an anti-immigrant, you know, he wrote SB 1070, like horrible human being. Um, but we realized what we had in, the, in places like that, that you have to make a good analysis of power. What is our power analysis? We don't have power if we're going to stay in this small circle and it's only going to be about immigrants or about... Right. We, we quickly realized that for a state like Kansas, where we had an elect, the, the entire electorate is 800,000 people, 11% African American, 13% Latino, that if we just got those two communities together and we came together around the thing that mattered to us and the state that we wanted to build, that we could do it if we worked together. And then it wasn't only that 11% it was or 13%, it was also other white progressives in the state. And if, if we could only bring those three people together, we could win things. And that's how we look in places in places like Kansas and in rural communities, as an organizer, you, you learn to think that way because organizing is always about a power assessment, right? A, a, an assessment of your power, meeting people where they're at, an assessment of your power too, and also learning to read the landscape. You're not, I'm not gonna like 
and, and that to me, I guess both in my life as an immigrant was always about translating these concepts of organizing and, and, and what I did in church and actually delivering both to people. And I think it was, it's a, I did a little bit of that in, in small towns in rural Kansas. And I see the same thing happening now um, with the organizing that we do at People's Action, especially in rural communities. Thank you. Jennifer, I've saved you for last year um, because you are the research director at ERI and you are, just like me, connected to a university that is not a, a community organizer in the same way that uh, these organizations that our panelists represent. And we're engaging in research with community organizers. We're um, in a state of a different positionality. And with that in mind, I wanted to ask, um, you know, what are some of the efforts used to build lasting movement infrastructure from your position at ERI and for ERI in general within this context of, of being a university engaged in this partnership-based research, but still, you know, in a different place on the ground in the playing uh, of, this, of this work? Okay. That's a really good question. And I was, I gave Joseph a ride over here and was actually talking to him um, about trying to about the need for us as researchers and at ERI to actually also have a power analysis mm -hmm. and to also kind of build that strategic muscle of understanding the landscape, understanding the dynamics that are happening, and re recognizing that research and data is a factor in, of power along with a mobilizable base, along with demonstrated action, along with financial resources. It is a factor of power, but it is only one factor of, that gives any entity or organized group a power and influence. And so we're very clear about the limitations of just standalone research, academia. Um, we believe in knowledge and being right, and we believe in the rigor of academic methods. But we, and we also need to recognize our the own privilege, the biases um, in society, of foundations, elected officials, of politicians who, who <laughs> see somebody coming in affiliated with USC and automatically kind of think, oh, okay, this person must know what they're saying. Oh, oh, here, we'll give you lots of funding because <laughs> you probably have lots of smart people over there. Um, whereas I've been a researcher on the community side where you're fighting tooth and nail, um, where you can be doing the research but it's seen as biased. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, it's been a real, um, it's been important um, to be at a research institute, to be affiliated with the university and to be very real and humble um, and but very intentional about how we wield kind of our affiliation with the university because yes, we can get into certain spaces. Yes, we can move certain, certain resources. Um, we can speak to another audience. And so that's how I feel like we've been able to use our research at, um, at ERI in different ways. Sometimes it's, you know, the folks will have a question like, hey, if we were to reform property tax, the system for property tax in California, like how much money could we get? <laughs> like, hmm, that's interesting. And so we can actually use some of our data and analysis, train people about the methods so that they become the experts in how we came up with those at revenue estimates so that they can use that number to build <laughs> coalitions, to think about the policies. But we've also been able to do research um, a lot of translational research, and so a lot of research um, that we we get to be in conversations like this with many of the leaders that I see as on the cutting edge and the leading edge of movement building. We've been able to translate that work to philanthropy and to where they have been able to fund, and actually now more and more folks are uh, more and more philanthropic um, Supporters are actually embracing power and embracing the need and less heeding the calls for needing to invest in more infrastructure rather than just initiatives or <coughs> campaigns or year-by-year -year funding. Um, so we've been also um, in a position where we've been able to be alongside folks um, like those on the panel and to 
just to imagine now, like if the if these folks were given the resources um, that they really need, what where could we be as a state? Like what what are the possibilities? And being able to do that kind of translational research for um, for different sectors um, has been also a way that we've been able to use our position here at the university, and hopefully bring on do our part in bringing on and building the bench, building a deeper bench of folks who can do this type of research. So that when Mark says, hey, I need to, you to do this project, <laughs> he can say, hey, look, we have lots of others who can also do this work. Um, and that's also the responsibility I see as being based at the university in our role is particularly how can we be a place where we're a training ground, where we're learning by doing, teaching by doing, um, by getting folks involved in our different projects and getting engaged with the community. Thank you so much. Yeah. Can, Go ahead, Mark. can I just uh, can I just add? You know, ERI plays such a critical role within the context of our movement ecosystem. Um, you know, when the Freedom Fund was being established. Uh, Manuel Pastor was at the table with Anthony Thigpen and Kathy Cha to really develop the strategy, provide critical data um, that people were using to make decisions. And I think that that is um, this, this component of contributing to infrastructure is often very much overlooked within the context of our work. Um, and you know the Freedom Fund is uh, part of the power building ecosystem for the Black community in a way that you know there's a Women's Foundation, there's an Asian Pacific Fund, there's a Latino Community Foundation. We have this really rich tapestry of group serving philanthropic institutions within California, and yet we didn't have one for for Black folks. And so um, I see ERI as a critical partner and a catalyst to kind of help build that infrastructure. But also, you know, when we talk about the naming and framing, the, you know, Stokely Carmichael has a really wonderful way of articulating power. Um, but, you know, it's, and, and I'm not going to offer any quotes, uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, he talks about, um, the ability for everyday people to kind of name and frame their phenomena and then be able to assert their will to, ch to change it. And having the data to kind of make sense of what people are experiencing is really, really critical because there's so much gaslighting mm. that happens in our society where people are being told, oh, it's not the school to prison pipeline. It's, you know, really, you know, your kid's just bad. Um, or you're not being stalked by the police, those, those you know, it, you just had a broken tail light. Um, you know, and so, you know, on so many different occasions, um, you know, we're being told that something is actually your fault or related to your behavior, uh, when in fact it is a systemic injustice and having the data to be able to articulate that narrative and to be able to then advocate for the change you want to see is so critical. And so I just want to put a plug in for ERI continuing to be uh, grounded uh, in the way that you are because it is so essential. Thank you for that. Um, before we open it up to audience questions, uh, I invited some of my students and I always like to leave them with like a practical nugget of something to take with them. Um, and so I'd hope from our, our three organizers, and Jennifer, do you have anything you want to add to this? Um, what's one thing you could tell a student, and that's all, all of us in this room are students learning, but what's something that you could tell us in this audience about what we could do in the next year to engage in building this infrastructure as members of our community? What's a, what's a tan, like an actual thing each of us could be thinking about doing? Or if you're like, I don't know, although I think you all have answers, <laughs> um, what's something we should be thinking about that we aren't considering? Um, I'll just, Soma, we'll start with you and go that way. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I came into this work two years ago because I realized that I was experiencing in the work that I was doing and personally dealing with like three overlapping crises. And I think Kim and I were just talking about this morning. The thing that lives in everyone's mind at the moment is just a constant 
there's so much information, but the three crises is like the disconnect, the climate crisis that we're all facing, and that you're, you're thinking, well, this, this, this democracy that we're part of, does it really matter? Does it really matter if I, you know, I, I talk to a lot of people, does it really matter if I vote or not? I, and so what I tell people that in this moment, the most transformative thing that I think we should be doing as, a, as human beings, as individuals, is getting out of our comfort, getting out of our comfort zone and like reaching out, talking to people. Like I want, I want people to have that fire in them to be connected to, other, to another human being because I think one of, the, one of the most critical things that happened during the pandemic is that not only did, did we experience isolation, we began to like it. And, and when we are isolated, we begin to think that we're right about everything. And so I think that the, 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 the muscle that we need to face, and I say this because I came into an organization that has done incredible work over the last 50 years, and I still have to say to people what the job of an organizer is, and that we get comfortable with being in our own space. So I would say to any individual, um, you need to get out of your comfort zone, and you need to go and meet people. To institutions, I say that institutions are the place where we learn how to govern, and we can build a multiracial democracy if we don't know how to govern the institutions that we're part of. And so that, the, the, the practice of leading institutions at this moment is crucial for how we govern and how we build the, the multiracial democracy that we need. So I would say, get out of your, get out of your comfort zone and explore, explore the, and, and stretch that muscle, flex that muscle of getting to know people that are not like you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would offer two quick things. One is uh, to invest in your own political education. Um, you know, for, for folks who are not connected to a movement-based organization or an organization that does community organizing, uh, take the time to research those in your community. Um, learn how you can be a part of their ecosystem. Um, are they doing activations or, you know, community events that you can be a part of? Um, really kind of study and work to push yourself uh, to, to, to have uh, an analysis that uh, is, is more radical um, than where you may come from. Uh, knowing that um, what your experience may have been coming up may not be the experience of others, uh, and yet still trying to find common ground, uh, I think is a really critical thing. So I would encourage you to um, invest in your own political education uh, and do that with a community of, of, of leaders who are doing this work on a, on, a, on a regular basis and who are grounded in a particular place. Um, the second thing I would say is, um, no matter what you're studying, <coughs> the movement needs you. Um, if you're a math major, uh, we need you. If you are into IT, we need you. Um, these uh, fields are not um, uh, mutually exclusive, you know. There is uh, all of what you have on a campus uh, can contribute to uh, social justice organizations um, and I think it's a it's a little bit of a lie uh, for people to believe that those things aren't needed in this space uh, so I would encourage you to uh, pursue what you're pursuing in, in terms of your studies but to know that uh, whatever that is it's going to add value if your heart is in the right place and if your your politics are right you know there are organizations that can that can use you and so uh, you, should, you should not feel like, oh, I'm a you know, math major or uh, I'm an a, a IT person. This has nothing to do with me. No, it very much has everything to do with you. Um, and so get connected and leverage that talent. Why are you knocking, why are you knocking on math majors? <laughs> I was a math major. <laughs> Ready for social oh <laughs> Exactly. Bring it home. <laughs> so say yes, yes. And concretely, there's a lot of organizations right down the street. Um, and there's a big election coming up. Yes. So lots of 501c3, like just public education. Um, 
So I just think it's a really great opportunity to go out and go door to door, do knocking, join a precinct team, um, and go door to door knocking right around here. Um, there's yeah. gonna be lots of that happening, and I think that is the most valuable life lesson yeah. you can yeah. learn and pick up yeah. in this year. It's really good. I, I was wondering, Mark, if doctors are also invited. Yes, <laughs> yes. We need doctors too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would just want to second the kind of affirmation for ERI here at USC. I mean, ERI just plays such a critical role in our ecosystem uh, as thought leaders, as uh, an institution that helps develop research that is useful to us. But I would also say critically, and this is a way of answering your question, Leah, ERI is, I think, helping to change our culture around learning in our movement. There's a Buddhist proverb that I love. It says that in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are few. And I think there are lots of incentives in our ecosystem to act like we have it all figured out like we're experts in organizing or social change, yeah. like we've developed the formula for how you change the world. But if you walk outside this room, you look at the world, none of us have figured it out. Right. And I think ERI is creating a structure and helping to contribute to a culture that is much more reflective and interrogative of what is working and what's not working so well so that we can learn with and from each other in ways that aren't possible without institutions like ERI. And I will also say, in this room is uh, a woman named Lisa Thornton, who is on our staff. She is our director of data and research. Pico California has, is investing our own precious general operating resources to partner with groups like ERI and others to help advance our learning. I would also second the encouragement around proximity. Yeah. Um, a few years ago, I got to meet Pope Francis, actually right before Holy Week. It's Holy Week right now. And I'll tell you the long version of the story someday, but the short version is I asked him in Spanish. I said, what words of animo, of, of encouragement, could you share with me that I can share with others in the United States who are accompanying those who are marginalized and excluded? And he cut me off. And he leaned in and he pointed at me like this and he said, quédate con el pueblo. Which means stay close to the people. Stay yeah. with the people. And then he said it again, quédate con el pueblo. They said, you have to listen deeply for what the people are yearning for and allow them to teach you. And then he said it a third time, pero quédate con el pueblo. Stay with the people, stay close to the people. Um, and we also have a saying in organizing that the greater distance you are from a problem, the easier it is to philosophize. Yeah. So just some more encouragement around that. And the last thing I'll say is, you know, Pico California and many others are a part of getting a new institution, hopefully what will become a $100 million institution called the California Movement Innovation Collaborative, formerly known as the I-Center, <laughs> which will be, we hope, at the forefront of partnering with groups like ERI and others to accelerate the evolution of power building and social change in California and across our country. And one of the things we think we need a lot more help understanding, there's so many things we're trying to do better, right? And we are right now in the midst of a pilot project with Jennifer and ERI to develop research and learning projects, initiatives, to then execute those research projects with grassroots partners on the ground. And then thirdly, to glean learnings from those research projects to develop uh, best practices, learning guides, um, ways of doing it better. All that really matters, but there seems to us to be a fourth step that is critical that we need help figuring out, which is the integration step. Mm. It's one thing to find better ways to do the work, it's another thing to actually do it. Yeah. Because our organizations have developed ways of doing things for a long time sometimes. And culture change inside organizations is tough. It requires leadership. It often requires stopping doing things the way we've been doing them and starting to do it differently. And how that gets integrated, moved from the report to actual on the ground practice is an area where we need a lot of help and partnership. 
Thank you so much. We're really excited to open up to a couple questions from the audience. Um, I'll just reiterate the word question, not statement. <laughs> Thank you. All right, who is the brave soul that's got a question? And don't try to take the mic from me. I'm holding the mic. <laughs> Who's got a question? No questions? All of them have been answered? Yes, brave soul. All right, this side of the room. Thank you for your question. Pre med student. Right, right. Wow, that was some good gems dropped there by the panel, right. right? Okay, what's your question? Um, my question is um, in regards to building solidarity between movements and communities, like specifically like POC uh, demographics and communities, like what might all of your thoughts be? Like I'm specifically interested in like Asian American and Black Amer uh, um, African American solidarity and Latino solidarity. So what are all of your thoughts on that? Just curious. Yeah. I lost my thoughts on solidarity, coalition building. I mean, I, I'd say that there are lots of organizations that are doing that important work and, you know, we all work together up here and, um, you know, the, the, the groups that come to mind specifically, uh, like APIs for Black Lives um, and uh, the Asian American uh, uh, Civic Engagement Fund tend to do deep work and partnership uh, with the black community and I, I believe that it's that kind of movement solidarity work that is actually a prerequisite for any type of change in California. Um, so we need to build up infrastructure and capacity in each of our communities uh, but it's important that we sit at shared tables where we're advancing shared goals uh, because none of us has the capacity to achieve what we want on our own. That's right. And so um, I appreciate the spirit of the question and you know, hope those two examples of, of entities are good ones. There are probably many more that are just not coming to me right now. Um, but um, that, especially uh, in LA, I think is, is like a critical kind of uh, 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 piece of how the organizing kind of racial justice ecosystem is taking shape. Yeah, and I, I would just, one thing I would just add, I think the, the thing I, lo I love about organizing is that it's always, organizing is always about disorganizing, and I think one of the things that has happened, at least in my experience over the last two, three and a half years after the 2020 election, I think there was an assessment, and I think we've been in a, like two, maybe two and a half years of like a reckoning moment for like how much power we actually don't have and so there's a, a lot of conversation um, at the national level um, with uh, organizations and networks that I work with around that assessment of power and the need to really like if we're going to build if we're going to over the you know if over the next 10 years the kind of power that we need we need to really go deep with our own institutions about the need to build and one of the reasons I came back to people's action was best, especially because this is the, the need to build this as a multi-issue, multi-racial, understanding worldview in a different way and, and how our liberations are tied to each other. It's now more critical than ever. Yes. And ju just to add briefly to that, there's a professor at Queens College named um, Daniel Jose Gatsambide. He's a Puerto Rican professor who says something very similar to what Heather McGee says in a book called The Some of Us, which has been very influential on in our thinking. He says that what we have to do is help people see the intersectionality of their suffering, including white folks, to understand how it is that white supremacy, hyper-capitalism, hyper-individualism is actually bad for us all, including white folks. And it affects us differently. It's not to say that it affects and impacts everyone the same. It doesn't. But to look upstream and to understand the forces that are creating our realities and to see how that hurts us all. And then the flip side of that, to see how deeply interconnected and interdependent we truly are, even though we live in a society that would like us not to believe that, is, is the flip side of that coin. We can't just stay in the suffering space. We all have, also have to move into the hopeful space, which we find when we share story and we share sacred space with them. And we share poems with each other. Finding common ground. So one last question, just because we're short on time. Is that okay, Jen? 
Okay. Hi, I just wanted to ask all of you, uh, I know you're all in various ways getting people engaged as we come up to the, the, the fall elections. What particular campaigns, what particular strategies do you uh, see not only helping hopefully win, uh, but, but to leave something, your organization and other organizations stronger no matter what happens in the election? Yeah. Uh, post -election. Yeah, that's a great question, and I am glad that I can answer it now because we just had a retreat um, last week to talk about this. So one of the things that I that has been part of what both our you know, 42 directors and our board, our staff have been talking about. So we we have been operating for the last 10 years out of our, what we call our long-term agenda, which is our 40-year plan to achieve the kind of democracy that we need um, in this country. And I, and so as we think about this election, it keeps, it, as we think about this election, um, we think that our jobs as or organizers, because our, you know, our marching orders are like, we, we cannot afford to have an authoritarian president. We have got to figure out how do we best build power. In the, and, and if we're looking towards the next 10 years, which is our plan, um, we're basically asking ourselves a question, like if it's a question of power, we have to think, okay, if we're gonna do this work of building power for our people over the next four years, which terrain is better, a neoliberal or a fascist? And I think the answer becomes very simple for us. And so when we get into conversations, like I was with my staff, organizing staff last week, and they were saying, well, you know, I just want you to know that, that not all the staff is aligned on whether we should endorse Biden, and, and, and my conversation was, this has nothing to do with how our staff feel. It actually has to do with doing our job as organizers, which is two things. is about creating a power analysis and creating a space for the people that we serve to make a decision. And our number one job as organizers is to create space for people to have what they need to make a decision. And then if we're, do, if we're coming at it from a power analysis for us is, the question that I said earlier. We've got four years to work towards 2028. Where do, how do, what is the easiest way, path for us to build the power that we need? And when we look at it like that, the answer is clear whether we like or don't like the person that we have to choose in front of us. Um, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, I got to ask the questions I was really excited to ask, uh, which I guess is a benefit of being the moderator. Uh, but I wanted to end on a forward-thinking, perhaps positive, however you think of it, kind of note. Um, and I just want to ask a panelist, but a short little bit um, that you could offer up in this tumultuous year about what is giving you hope. We'll start with, um, we'll start at the end, Joseph. We'll start with you and come this way. One minute. <laughs> it's on. Yes, I want to um, share something that gave me a lot of hope the other day. I'm just looking at the email. Um, yeah, so two times a year, we hold le week-long leadership trainings for grassroots community leaders and organizers. There was a, an immigrant mother named Lydia from Sacramento who went to our recent training in January. One of the things that she learned there was that leaders lead. Leaders lead. Volunteers can lead. They don't have to wait for their organizer to lead them. And so I got a picture from one of our organizers after that training showing Lydia taking members of her family, members of her congregation to the school board meeting uh, to demand some changes to the school district's policy on expulsions um, without her organizer. And she said, look, my organizer isn't here. I learned that in the training, and I'm taking more action because leaders need. And I think the work of social change and changing history happens in one person at a time, one story at a time of transformation. The question is, how do we scale that so that it's happening more frequently across our state? Thank you. What gives me hope? I'm looking at Vanessa because a couple of weeks ago um, we went. We were invited to go back to Scope because we both worked there. Um, after and so after 15 years, um, I went back to talk with the organizers, and it, one of the organizers was the son of one of the former, of one of the members 
Um, and it was just, I remember, like, from being child care, taking care of child, <laughs> like, I remember, like, the research room was, like, the defunct um, child care room. <laughs> and so to now see him organizing and organizing other young people, it just, that gives me hope. Uh, what gives me hope is there are more and more of us who share a positive vision for change. Um, there's an expanding tent of people who are organizing for good. And it is showing up in so many different ways. I know that sometimes our politics at the federal level can be a bit grim. But you know, you heard about the Movement Innovation Collaborative. You heard about ERI's work. You heard about our work with the Black Freedom Fund. And these are all kind of microcosms of this broader um, expansion of a racial justice ecosystem and people who are drawn to a very powerful vision for how the world could be, mm -hmm. right? And, and actively working towards that. And so that's what gives me hope every day is that you know more and more people are coming uh, alive with this passion and this kindling. Um, uh, to, to drive change and that ultimately people have the answers. And so um, I'm excited about that and I'm excited for all of you who are drawn to that vision, who will be you know, in the movement with us. I, I have a lot of hope um, in this moment because look, we have an opportunity to govern. And I am part of a network and there are like five other networks Community Change, Faith in Action, CPD, People's Action, Gamelio, Yaya, all these networks were started with like, as imperfect as they you know, may have been. It create, they created an opportunity for people of color, a lot of women of color, to now be leading those networks. And we have an opportunity to ask ourselves what we want the next 50 years to look like. Whether, you know, I, I have a five-year contract with my board. I asked for a, a five-year contract, so I know I won't be in here to see it all. But I see young women, and I see women and women of color standing up to say, no, I think we're going to do this differently, and that yes. gives me hope. Yes. Also, what gives me hope is my three beautiful daughters that are 34, 30, and 25. They think very differently. They have very different opportunities than what I had when I was coming up, growing up 30 and some years ago. So I, that, that gives me hope. So if nothing else, I think that we begin to shift, you know, to shift directions, even if it's just a little bit in a different way, we're already interrupting the five decades of how things were done. So that gives me hope. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we're bringing up our illustrious uh, Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, really impressive panel. But I also want to uh, make sure we put out a big applause for our moderator. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, she banned you in postdoc, and we're just so proud and so glad that she's been part of this. Um, so I want Bass to provide a few words of summary. And I know there's two people on the panel who are particularly glad that I was not moderating Mark and Joseph, uh, because I would have been relentlessly teasing them the whole time. Uh, Mark about being an illegal student early in his life, of course, and then Joseph, because I've heard every one of those stories before. And, and dude, they're not that inspirational. Uh, but I, 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 I love everyone on this uh, panel, and I'm so glad that they were here. Uh, what I want to talk about is closing gaps. I think that all of us are really interested in closing gaps. The gaps that exist uh, in terms of the persistent racial disparities uh, in our economy, our environment, uh, in every other aspect of our lives. The persistent income gaps, we now have got a 1% earning more than in any, earning more, taking more, than at any point in US history since the Gilded Age. Uh, and we actually have a kind of gap between today and tomorrow in the sense that we've got a planet cooking and inaction occurring right now today 
when we've got a world to save. So I want to suggest that if we're interested in closing those gaps, that we've learned a little bit today about some gaps that we also need to close. One of those gaps is meeting people where they are versus where they, we wish they were. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not just about being with the woke. It's about figuring out who needs to be awoken mm -hmm. and what it is you need to do to get uncomfortable meeting someone you've never met before. I think the second thing we need to think about is how do we close the gap between our message and a majority? You know, it's inconceivable with this much injustice, with this much inequality, with this much desperation, that we're not more successful. Yeah. And it means that our message is not really yet majoritarian. And how do we do that by moving the middle rather than moving to the middle by lifting up the lessons we need? The third thing which I'm really pulling away from this panel is how do we close the gap between love and confrontation? We tend to, I really love that steady, loving confrontation. Uh, the next time I use it, I will make sure to quote you. Then after that, I will forget uh, that you ever said it and <laughs> claim that it was one of my ideas for uh, decades now. Uh, but we think about uh, confrontation, but how do we do this with a willingness to come again to meet that person at that local bar uh, in Wichita mm -hmm. to understand that love and confrontation can go together? The fourth gap that we need to close that I'm pulling from this panel is the gap between heartfelt empathy and hard-headed power analysis. <laughs> Just because someone uh, we have a lot of empathy for in terms of the problems in people's lives, we also need a strategic analysis of how much power we've got, what we need to move, and what it takes to be able to make change. The fifth gap, which I think was really striking in one of the stories that Joseph started with, is the gap that we sometimes put between foot soldiers and strategic leaders. Yeah. That is, that there are strategic leaders and then there's people who are just going to march instead of how do we pick up on the wisdom of community members, people who are the closest to the pain. The sixth gap that I think that we need to close that comes from this panel is the gap between this moment, which is huge, and our movement infrastructure, which is weak. And we have to accept a concrete analysis of how weak it is, but figure out what we need to do to strengthen the parts we need in a moment in which authoritarianism is clearly on the agenda and clearly a temptation for so many. One gap that did not come up that I think is really critical is the gap and Sulma and I, I, should, I, I'm about to say Sulma and I have written about this together. It's really that Sulma uh, suggested it and I added my name, uh, <laughs> which is the gap between movements and philanthropy. That is, and this is something that Mark is trying to close in his current position, which is how do we get philanthropy that wants to do good to actually understand that to make good happen, we need to actually fund organizing, community power building, love and confrontation uh, in sustainable five-year contract kind of ways. Uh, and that gap between movements and philanthropy, we didn't discuss it much today, but I know we discussed it in prep, and I know it preoccupies us. But the message I want to leave this particular audience with is how do we close the gap between the university and community. And I want to suggest to you that one of the kind of things underneath what we did today was the following. There's a lot where people think that in the university we theorize, we lay out kind of ways to analyze things, and then we apply it to a world that is in need of our strengths and wisdom and bereft of their own skills at doing this. What you heard from our three organizers, and uh, Jennifer, who got most of her ideas from organizing, actually, uh, is the wisdom that's coming from the field. And the gap that exists in the academy 
of being able to strongly listen to it and figure out how to be of use right back to understand and lift up community wisdom and figure out how the university can actually walk in partnership with community, how research can be coupled with action, how we can actually do engage research on this side that, as Jennifer said, acts from a space of humility, a space of learning, and also an understanding of what tools we can bring to bear. So our task, for those of you who are students here, for those of you who are professors, is to figure out how it is that we close this gap and really have an engaged uh, university that actually contributes to the powerful movements we need right now to be able to make change. I want to thank you all for being here, and I want to turn things over yes. to Dr. Kim Tabari to close us out. Thank you. Well, give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you all for being here. Jody, Rhonda, and the ERI staff that are here helping us today. And lastly, thank you. And lastly, I want to thank the Torpangian Family Educational Foundation for their general support and vision to endow the civic society and social change chair to the, and today's event and our postdoc. Our next event is the 2025 state. 2024, sorry, I'm a year ahead. 2024 State of Immigrants in Los Angeles Summit happening in person in July. So look for more details on our social media, ERI underscore USC. If you're not following us, I don't know, something's wrong with you. You should be following us. We also have uh, community engaged research small grants rolling out soon. So definitely check our websites for that, grad students, faculty and postdoc scholars can apply for those grants. So everyone, please stay safe, stay healthy, stay engaged in social change work to uplift our communities, California, and the nation. Thank you, and hope to see you soon.